So Fran Mayer, uh, who's behind the scenes with much of this conference and what happens here, asked me to give this talk. He called me, he's like, give a talk entitled Everything You Need to Know About Sex. And I thought, Fran must think very, very highly of me. <laughs> and as I jogged my, my, my brain for everything you need to know about sex, I came up with a list. Uh, one, alcohol makes you more attractive. <laughs> You're welcome. Two, uh, foreplay includes things like doing dishes and taking out trash. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Uh, three, no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> as I contemplated and prayed on this topic, a piece of advice Fran gave me years ago, that he doesn't remember this, uh, came to mind. I was having a particularly bad day, and I was in my 30s. I was walking down the hallway at the Archdiocese of Denver, and he was Archbishop Shapey's right-hand man. And I don't know if he could see that something was wrong in my heart, but he put his hand on my shoulder, an older guy who I just looked up to a lot, as everybody did in the building. He's a rock star. And he said, it gets better. I said, what? And he goes, sex. <laughs> And then he gave me the reason. I, I, and I was expecting something about skill or frequency to come up. <laughs> and he said, because you stop taking yourself so seriously. You stop taking yourself so seriously. And I think that that advice sums up everything I'm about to tell you right now. See, a, a key to happiness in the bedroom or in your life in general is, is, is a life where it's not all about you. And follow me here, that life that's not about you is a life that's actually lived in reality. See, because when life is about you, whether it's sex or your job, you are living separated from reality. You are living on Captain You Planet. <laughs> and at the risk of oversimplifying everything, my own journey to purity as a young man, navigating sexual healing and a, from past abuse from my wife, the mess the world is in right now. It's all about a battle between the real and a virtual reality that separates us from actual love. The real, where there's consequences to actions, where there's a created order because there's a God, where there's a moral code, where there's sacrifice, where there's a metaphysical significance to the human body that we don't just make up for ourselves, where there's pain versus a virtual world that's free of the shackles of all that, but there's also no actual joy. <laughs> to share my own journey to reality from the fake when it comes to sex, I'm a proud member of Generation X. My heroes were Slash from Guns N' Roses and Jeff Spicoli. And, and my parents dragged me to a retreat at a time in my life where my priorities, I, I wanted to be like those guys. I wanted to party and use girls, and that's what I thought life was about. They dragged me to a retreat that I did not want to go on, so I love coerced religious experiences for teenagers. <laughs> and the thing that changed my life on this retreat was not the eloquence spoken from the stage. It was the joy in the room. The first Christians called themselves the living ones. And when I saw the living ones in this room, and I remember one guy was probably 60 years old, 65, he wasn't cool. He looked nothing like Slash. I saw the joy in his face, and I realized Slash is dead. Jeff Spicoli's barely alive. I want what that guy has. It brought me into a journey to the real, I, real life, real joy, amen? amen. But there's a difference between that, that choice I made for Jesus and real life that weekend and actually living that life. You take vows on your wedding day and think, I'm all in. I give my life to you. You're so beautiful today, right? You don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> I choose Jesus as Lord of my life. Dude, you don't know what you're talking about, kid, but that's a good choice. Let's get on that journey where you give everything to him. And, and, I, and I, about a year later, in this journey with the Lord, I'm uh, in eighth grade going to freshman year of high school, and I was on another retreat that was life-changing in a different way. This guy, who was probably 45 years old, had the courage to stand in front of a bunch of eighth grade kids, and he said, I'm going to talk to you right now about the M word. And I was thinking, please, God, don't let him mean what I think he means right now. And he said, I'm going to talk about masturbation. And, and this guy gave a testimony where he cried in front of us eighth grade kids about his slavery to lust that lasted for decades in his life. And my mind was blown. I thought, pleasure and slavery? I'm free, right? G.K. Chesterton said that the moment sex ceases being a servant, it becomes a tyrant. 
And after that conference, I went home as a little kid, and I realized I was a slave to lust. I was a slave to my sin. Jesus wanted that part of me. Making Jesus Lord of my life means making Jesus Lord of also that part of my life. And, and I'm not sure if it, was, if it was genuine love for the Lord or my pride and my desire not to be enslaved to anything, but it started a battle with that sin in my life. I didn't want to be a slave. So I did something called good old-fashioned penance. I was in love with Jesus. I was reading about St. Francis at the time. I'm not sure I'd recommend this to most teenagers, but I, I decided every time I fall into this sin, I don't care what the season is, I'm going to take my shoes off and run around my block. And I'm going to go face to face to confession to add pain to it. Now, some people think this is just, you know, part of the past. You know, you don't want to do the penance thing. Well, there's a book called, recently written called Atomic Habits. It talks about coupling habits you want to, jo want to develop with things you enjoy. If you like a glass of wine and you need to work out, only let yourself work out. I'm sorry, only let yourself have wine after you work out. So you psychologically associate this thing with a reward. And he said, likewise, with things you don't want to do, associate pain with it. You want to use your phone less? Make your, make your cord shorter and put it right near the wall so you have to get up to use your phone at night, right? This is, pop psychology is discovering that we Catholics have been right for thousands of years. <laughs> Guys, I kicked that sin in high school. And running around the block, I got very large calves, right? <laughs> but... But I learned some of the most important lessons in my life through that struggle, and I think this is why God allows that to be a struggle that most young men experience, to teach them these lessons. And if the struggle was with things like theft and murder, uh, the world would be on fire, right? So this is a relatively benign struggle compared to other things, so thank God it's this. But I, I learned that I needed a savior. I learned the joy of struggling with vice and achieving actual virtue. I learned that my Heavenly Father loved me even when I humiliated myself, I learned to make a good confession. I learned to come to God as I was. I love the prayer of St. Augustine, Lord, help me be pure, but not yet. It's a real prayer. You know why he became a saint? Because he didn't try to fake God out. He came to God as he was and eventually said, you've made us for yourself, O oh God, our hearts are restless till they rest in you. I won that battle and I came in touch with the real world. A real painful world where, I don't know, I'd have to have actual self-denial, where I might be denied by a real woman. So you don't have to deal with that kind of thing if you're just looking at porn all the time. There's no real. <laughs> I learned to give up the counterfeit. Fast forward to college. Franciscan University of Steubenville. I <laughs> I fell in love at Franciscan University of Steubenville. First, with the sacrament of marriage. I thought maybe God was calling me to priesthood, and I learned about marriage, and it blew my mind. On the natural level, marriage is so stunningly beautiful. Check this out. This is from the nuptial blessing. O oh God, this is the, the blessing given at a wedding mass. O oh God, by whom woman is joined to man, and the companionship they had in the beginning is endowed with one of with the one blessing not forfeited by original sin nor washed away by the flood. How awesome is that? On the natural level, this is the one thing that wasn't washed away by the flood, this beautiful union of man and woman. And on the supernatural level, the nuptial blessing, this is also from that blessing, O God, who consecrated the bond of marriage by so great a mystery that in the wedding covenant you foreshadowed the sacrament of Christ and his church. Mm. Guys, the sacramentality of marriage blew my mind as a young man. When, when, I, when I realized a sacrament, you have an efficacious sign instituted by Christ to give grace. It's a sign, and what it symbolizes becomes the reality. It actually happens in the Eucharist, bread and wine, body and blood, right? And it actually had we encountered the Lord here. And in marriage, a symbol of, of Jesus and his love for the church, the church's love for Jesus. And that symbol actually becomes a sacramental vessel for what it symbolizes. And I thought, I could get married, and the, the Lord would make me a sacramental vessel for this woman. I fell in love with the sacrament of marriage. I wanted to be that sign. I wanted to be like Jesus in that way. Guys, all you married couples, you should be a homily from the Lord. If a child says, you know, how does Jesus love us? The answer could be, well, look at how Dan loves Andrea. Look at how Pat loves Laura. That's how. And how do we respond? Well, look at how Laura loves Pat. Look at how Carol loves John. That's how. And then, guys, then I met the woman that I was to marry. 
My first mass at Steubenville, very first mass, I was deep in prayer and I was scoping the chapel for women. <laughs> Don't judge me. And uh, the first woman I checked out at Steubenville was Natalie. And I, and I thought she was out of my league. Thankfully, uh, she disagreed with me on that. Our second date, I was playing guitar to her, this love song, Annie's song, and she said, stop right now. Why? I'll tell you later. Later, she told me that ever since she was a little girl, she thought the first guy that played that song to her would be the guy she'd marry. <laughs> so I, we got married. And I entered marriage thinking, I got this purity thing down pat, right? I didn't look at porn. I kicked that in high school. And, and I thought that because I was so pure of heart, that, that God would reward me with the world's most amazing sex. And also that would happen because I thought, dude, look at me, I'm like Thor, right? I mean, like, this is, it's gonna be, every day I will prove my manhood and woo her, maybe multiple times a day. Actual sex within marriage wasn't quite like that. <laughs> first 10 years of our marriage uh, went by and I, I, I kind of realized over time uh, something was off. Something was, was wrong. And I, I was good at not facing that something. I was good at not looking at the fact that she looked afraid of me sometimes. I was good at not seeing her frigidity because it was too painful for me to look at. So I, was, I had this denial that I lived in, which ain't just a river in Egypt, denial. Long story short, my wife was the victim of childhood sex abuse. A, a, a sibling's friend came over, and it's always the people you don't expect. And she brought that into, into our marriage. And when I realized that, it was one of the most painful moments in my life, because I was so good at seeing things as I wanted to and not as they were, that my whole world was spinning. This is one of the moments in my life, one of the, maybe the only moment where I just wanted to die. And as I felt the pain and shock of thinking I've been deceiving myself, uh, the, the fundamental temptation I faced as a kid came back to me. No, not a temptation of porn or masturbation or anything like that. More broadly, a temptation to flee reality. Because there's pain in reality, isn't there? Hmm. How? How was I tempted to flee reality? Well, I was overtly told by Natalie's first counselor, who we promptly fired after this advice, Chris should, look, Chris should masturbate, Chris should look at porn. Don't sit in the pain between you. Have him go find his pleasure somewhere else. He doesn't, quote, pressure you to get better. But guys, I chose reality. I chose to sit in the division and wait. Because that's what love does, even when it's not comfortable. Love chooses reality. Love is reality. I was tempted. I was tempted to, to break with the church's teaching on natural family planning. Can I just say there were times in my, in my married life that I've hated NFP. No fun for Papa. <laughs> and, and the difficulties of, of, of NFP are very real sometimes overlooked when they're telling you how great this creative continence thing is, and it's like, yeah, great. <laughs> and, um, but it's even worse if, if someone suffered from sexual abuse, because the, the time that it's okay to come together if you're trying to postpone a pregnancy is the time that biologically, woman's not in the mood. When the clock's ticking, get yourself in the mood, sex abuse victim, because that doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so in the midst of that pain, I was literally praying, like, Lord, is there a loophole to this for me? Can I be special? Can I, can I get out of the boundaries of reality? And this is one of the few times the Lord spoke to me in a very overt way, because he knew I was struggling in my heart and really asking that question. And, and, I, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and a realization was upon me that was a voice from God, not audibly, but in my heart. And he said, Chris, are you really asking me to overturn the moral laws that govern the universe so you could have sex with your wife more often? <laughs> Never mind. Guys, <laughs> ordinary Christian life and saying I will be in reality means I will be a creature subject to the rules even when they don't work for me. 
which sometimes for a Christian means martyrdom, very tidy splendor, John Paul II, faced with the many difficulties which fidelity to the moral order can demand, even in the most ordinary circumstance, the Christian is called, with the grace of God invoked in prayer, to a sometimes heroic commitment. As Gregory the Great teaches, one can actually love the difficulties of this world for the sake of eternal rewards. I had to say, okay, the rules are grinding me to dust. I accept. I'm not God. You are. And this life's not about me. As St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, all day long we are being slain. I chose reality. There were moments I wanted to just get in the car and run away, run away from the pain. The pain I was experiencing in marriage as, as, as I embodied all that my wife was afraid of. And the image of the sacred heart of Jesus helped me so much in this time in my life. I learned to be comfortable with pain, the pain one finds in the real. The sacred heart of Jesus is an image where he's got thorns and it's on fire and he's bleeding. Everything about this image says, ouch, this is the Christian way of life. And in the midst of that pain, I was brought to my knees to reality as a creature where I prayed a beautiful prayer many times that the Lord always answered. I said, Lord, I can't do this. I need you. I call upon the grace of the sacrament of marriage that you promised to give me to fulfill this vow. Kick in right now, Lord. Guys, every time he answered, every time, he's good for his promises. Call upon the grace. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. And, and, and because I, I chose to live comfortable with pain, I mean, there, there's something about pain that's like, I gotta get away, I'm drowning. No, 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 you don't have to get away, it's okay. Because I lived comfortable with that pain, the Lord revealed wounds I had that I didn't know I had. You know, you enter marriage thinking your wife is the healing balm for all your pain and all your wounds. Actually, your wife is the diagnosing finger of God on that broken arm. <laughs> is it broken here? Ow. How about here? Ow! Yeah, it's broken there. <clears throat> and also the healing balm. <laughs> But because I didn't run away, guys, God had healing for me in mind. This was my path. And it uncovered all my needs for approval, all the ways that I didn't feel like I measured up, all the ways that I had savior complexes, and you can't save this one, dude. You can't, you can't just make it go away. It uncovered the needs I had to keep the status quo, uncovered wounds I had, because I've actually never shared this publicly before. I, I was groomed by, a, by my priest when I was a kid. By the way, I would never leave Jesus because of Judas. Yeah. Instead of running away, I chose reality and God has freed me. And I learned what chastity actually was, the chastity I thought I'd mastered by not doing certain things. No, no, it's way more than that. The catechism beautifully sums up chastity as an integration of your sexuality into who you are. And I realized that my sexual drive was tied into so many, hooked onto so many other psychological needs that I had, my need for approval, my need to make things right, my need to be the man, my need to be successful, my need to matter. And as it was, I didn't own it because it was hooked to all these things. And I had this beautiful prayer I would pray, like, Lord, I unhook. My sexual drive from my need for approval, I hook it to you. And I unhook it from my need to feel like I matter, and I hook that to you. And as it took its proper place in me, it was integrated in the right way in who I am. Guys, I bowed before reality. I bowed before reality. And because of how I embraced reality, I was able to be part of my wife's healing from sexual abuse. And this has nothing to do with how I thought I would be the man entering marriage. But this is the journey that made me more of a man than I could ever have imagined. I am the man. <laughs> Let's turn our eyes to the world, attempting in 2022 to wash away 
the one blessing not removed by the flood. The original blessing of male and female, and at the risk of over, I'm sorry, oversimplifying things when it comes to sex, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexual ethics, when it comes to the birth process, and everything the world thinks will make you happy. It's all simply a rejection of the real. The world's inviting everyone to isolation on Captain You planet. And it's tempting, man, I get it. Before my journey, I judged people like, this is so easy to live this thing I'm not being challenged to live. Why can't you live this thing that I'm not being challenged to live? I get it, I used to judge the Israelites in the desert for all their complaints. Guys, the desert is a hard place to be. They were slaves to Pharaoh in a fake world, but they had three square meals a day. And they didn't have to face pain and they didn't have to live under the heat of the sun. I love the line in the Matrix where Morpheus says to Neo, who wakes up from this dream state, he says, welcome to the desert of the real. The world doesn't want that desert because the fake is easier. Colors and avatar are prettier than the real world. Porn is unencumbered from, and VR, unencumbered from the pain of real life and real relationships and being able to just click a button and donate to someone in Haiti, which you should do, and love my neighbor without loving my neighbor neighbor. <laughs> oh, it's so much easier. My neighbor neighbor sucks, you know, but like but the Haiti neighbor, that's, that's easy, right? God is calling us to live in the real and the world is calling us to the fake. Where do we see it? We see this fake world in porn. Porn offers that promise, the, the original promise of the evil one to escape reality. You shall be like gods. Of course, God's plan was always to raise us up and make him, us like him. But in our limited powers, by ourselves, without grace, the only way to make ourselves like gods is to lower everything else around us. Isn't that what porn does? John Paul II said the problem with porn isn't that it shows too much, it shows too little. You don't see a person there. Or the person that's portrayed is helpless before her own desire for that man who is like a god. Ooh, it's so evil. You shall be like gods. You know, promiscuity is actually dropping among teenagers when compared with Generation X. I'm actually not happy about this. Because it's not that lust is dropping. They're just disappearing into their own rooms. VR does it better than, than actual, actually trying to get a date and maybe doing something stupid. We see the fake offered to humanity in abortion. In a real world, there's something called consequences to actions. Well, this will hurt the autonomy of women. Yes, it will. And that's good. No human being deserves that much autonomy. The paterfamilias in Rome had total autonomy. No one will tell me what to do. And he had legal rights to throw his child out in the snow to die. He didn't deserve that much autonomy if he's going to be part of reality and a human family. It's fake. You shall be like gods with power over life and death. We see the fake offered to the world in the redefinition of marriage. Guys, the Catholic worldview when it comes to marriage isn't rooted in bigotry and hatred. It's rooted in something called reality. Marriage wasn't invented at a bishop's conference. It arose from the reality of the procreating nature of the human body and that when people come together, wah, happens. <laughs> wah, has a lot of needs apparently, so you should get in front of the village and say you're going to take care of her and give your life to her before you get to have sex. Pretty much every culture throughout history has figured this out and enshrined it with laws and rituals to protect it. Hatred has nothing to do with what I just said. Even cultures were, that were really open to homosexual acts didn't take that and call it marriage. They didn't call it marriage because it's, it's not. And we have no right to reinvent something we didn't invent. Now, is, is that hate? Well, if human beings are nothing but sexual beings, as the sexual revolution tells us, and if sex is the only way for us sexual beings to be fulfilled, and if marriage is the only way to go and fulfill that sexual desire and become who you are, then yes, it would be hate. I'm a Christian, guys. I don't believe any of that. I follow Jesus who was single. 
and who shows us what real love is, and it's living as a, as a human in reality, subject to reality, even when it's hard, even when it's painful. And I get that that's so painful for people who, who are same-sex attracted. But this, finally, guys, this, 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 this culminates, this, this divorce from reality culminates in radical gender ideology. And make no mistakes, guys, this is not a biological debate, it's a metaphysical one. This hits at the question, does the body have actual meaning that my passing moods don't affect? Is there a reality in my physicality? It's a metaphysical debate. And the world is saying more and more, no. You can cut parts off. And look, metaphysics tells me if I cut my leg off, I'm still what? A human being without a leg. Metaphysics would say, even if I rearrange my, my genitals, I'm still a man. <laughs> There's a whatness to me that my own choices can't change. But, but this, this culmination in the rejection from reality is almost spiritualized. And those who go there are revered as being liberated from the body. Demi Lovato, she considers herself, I'm sorry, they consider themselves. <laughs> I think gender fluid, non-binary. Oh man, if this is posted on YouTube, I'm gonna be canceled if I got that wrong. <sighs> because by the way, you can totally do that. You can totally consider yourself non-binary. She begins her podcast to millions with the words, welcome to the fourth dimension, which talks about gender issues. And listen, in, in, in the past, gender dysphoria was a massive cross to bear that very few people bore. About 0.01% of, of the population had that problem. And people who have that in a genuine way should be treated with the utmost compassion and be helped and be protected and be welcomed. But guys, in the past few years, what was 0.01% of the population has become a trend, and the pain of that trend is, is spreading in people's lives. The suicide rate of people who transition is through the roof, even though 85% of people who, who experience this, this dysphoria, it goes away into adulthood. We're encouraging kids to make permanent choices based on a temporary uh, confusion, and, and, and even in places where it's widely accepted, it's not the fault of you Christians, the suicide rate is still sky high. But it's exploding. 2007, there was one trans clinic in America. There are now 300. In Oregon, a 15-year-old can show up with no doctor's note, no note from a counselor, and leave a trans clinic with, with, with hormones to change who they are, to get a mastectomy with no parental consent at the age of 15. Nine percent of youth, according to one study, no longer identify with their birth gender. Nine percent, guys. And only 78% of teenage girls identify as cisgender, identifying with their body, and straight. Gee, I wonder if cultural norm shifting has something to do with this. I, I think the answer is obvious. Sadly, the question is completely forbidden, even if the question is asked, as I would, from a point of view of caring about the happiness of these kids. See, we live in a world where Isaiah 520, we call evil good and good evil. We call darkness light, light darkness. We call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. We call ugly beautiful and beautiful ugly. We call abandoning our children, accepting our children. Welcome to the upside down. <laughs> we renounce the patriarchy and tell men it's okay to pressure your girlfriend to have an abortion. We mourn people abusing women, and, and we sell out of Fifty Shades of Grey. Dude, we, 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 we blame conservatives for putting women down, and, and liberal campuses are, are, are rape cultures. It's unbelievable. There's a pandemic people aren't even talking about. We, we condemn traditional gender roles, and if a girl wants to play with trucks, we tell her maybe she has to have a penis. Are you kidding me? And you conservative Christians, man, if you had predicted any of this in 2014 when we started voting on gay marriage and everyone was telling you we're going to relabel you as hateful and bigoted for all your concerns about the common good, uh, that you're crazy, that you, you know, you'd be considered hysterical. Look, gaslighting isn't real. You're just crazy. Amen? Uh, oh, Chris, man, you sound like a culture warrior right now. No, actually, guys, let me tell you what I am. I'm an evangelist. And the greatest tragedy in all these lies, in the escape from reality, is that people who come now bearing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ are relabeled as hateful and bigoted. 
I'm friends with Father Mike Schmitz. He's been in, in campus ministry for 17 years. I asked him recently, what's changed? And he said, as, as, you know, as good looking as the guy is, he's like, I can't even start a conversation with someone who's not already interested now on a college campus. We come bearing the best news ever, says a guy wearing a Nazi outfit. And if they're right, that we are hateful and bigoted, guys, we shouldn't be able to start the conversation. They should shut us out. Of course, they're wrong. And this is a tactic that's very old, to label people hateful, bigoted. This is from Genesis 19. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. And when Lot said no, guess what the reply was? This fellow came here as a foreigner. Now he wants to play the judge. It's the same demons, guys. The devil has a short playbook. He just keeps repeating it because we don't live that long. <laughs> And if we could just live and let live. Guys, the world has no intention of just letting you be. Pharaoh didn't coexist with God's people. He lived in Captain U Planet, and someone who bowed to an actual God, he couldn't tolerate that person. The world is tolerating you less and less, has to control you less and less, has to silence you more and more, because God forbid you speak truth and people see reality, the desert of the real. It takes a very strong government to, to keep some of these things going. <laughs> this is why Sister Lucia, there was a, from the, one of the Fatima seers, she said, a time will come when the decisive battle between the kingdom of Christ and Satan will be over marriage and the family, the original blessing. And those who will work for the good of the family will experience persecution and tribulation. But do not be afraid because Our Lady has already crushed his head. Hallelujah. Yes. How do we win this fight? Guys, I'd say first, get calm and courageous and stop cowering before people. The world that's telling us, you're crazy. You don't think there's 76 genders? <gasps> they know that no one thought that five minutes ago. But they also know that human nature is cowardly. And then if you look at me and say, oh, you're crazy, my first response will be like, am I? I don't want to be crazy. I, I want to fit in. Oh, watching the mob, it's, it's, it's been astounding. I want you to be courageous even when it comes to people in the church who would gaslight you as being insensitive for calmly and lovingly telling the truth. Ephesians 4 warns against people who are, quote, skilled at proposing error. In other words, they probably went to a seminary. And I thank God for our bishops, for our priests, who are calmly proposing the truth, lovingly proposing the truth, despite the fact that some of their brother bishops and priests gaslight them as being insensitive and mean. Because guys, as a layman, thank you. As a layman, I need to be able to say, I'm with him. You don't have to do much, but please be strong. But ultimately, guys, this battle isn't going to be won because we can make a case that we're right. This battle will be won because we live a life that is real. And in order to proclaim that, it's not just about engaging a culture war out there. It's about engaging this battle with the real in our own hearts, with our own pain, with our own pasts, in our own bedrooms. And when we engage that battle, we find something strange in the midst of the pain of the desert. We find something called joy. As John Paul II preached at a World Youth Day, he said the path to joy is, quote, an uphill path. But he has walked it before us. He who said, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. I have known the joy of suffering with my bride and winning. I have known the joy of seeing that when I allow myself to feel the emptiness of the human condition, God fills me. I have known the joy of my own healing. I have known the joy that in one of my lowest moments, I was like, Lord, can't I just have a, quote, normal marriage while we're going through healing? By the way, does anyone here have a normal marriage? I 
I pivoted to gratitude in my heart and I realized, no, you have something better than normal. People who don't have these wounds will never know what it's like to have your wife come to you with her gift of self after having walked through fire and hell to give herself to you. Normal doesn't hold a candle up to that. <laughs> and I've known the joy of not only having Rosemary and Ethan, after whom I'd have probably been snipped if I weren't a Catholic. <laughs> the joy of also meeting Genevieve, Joey, <laughs> Eloise, and Clementine. And none of these blessings was waiting for me in Pharaoh's virtual world but only in the desert of reality. And I'll close with this. I've also known the joy of getting to share this with you today. Thank you.